Dynamite channel, welcome, hope you're doing well. Right, let's get going on some cluster rings. I haven't done a cluster ring before on this channel because I believe most of the people who are watching this channel are beginner jewelers or have got a little bit of experience or they've just come up against something. They want to find out specifically how to do a certain job or they've searched and then YouTubers brought them to my channel. So I, th I believe most of the people watching my videos are like that. But I also want this channel to be a place where people can go from beginner to advanced if they want to. So with that in mind, I need to spend more time and more regularly make intermediate difficulty to advanced level pieces. So that way you've got the whole spectrum of jewelry making just on this channel. Um, so let's get going on some cluster rings. When I say cluster ring, I'm talking about, like imagine a ring top, there's a stone in the center and it's surrounded by smaller stones. That's what I'm imagining when I say cluster ring. Uh, they can be really difficult. You can have a you can have two rows, three rows, or set different heights, uh, different fancy baskets underneath. Uh, they can be really difficult to make, really complicated, as difficult as you want them to be. But with that in mind, I want people, I'm assuming people are going to be trying this for the first time watching this video. So I thought, let's try a really simple one. So I've sort of got an idea of just stripping one back to the basics. So it's just the essence, the foundation of a cluster ring. So it's literally going to have no stones. It's just like the building blocks of a cluster ring. And the idea of doing it this way is people can see this video or make one, make the ring along while watching this video. And then they can understand what's going on when I'm doing it, why I'm doing this bit, why I'm doing that bit, why I join them up that way. And then there's a certain order. And then when you try the more difficult one, it was going to make more sense. It's going to be easier to follow what's going on. Um, afterwards we're going to be adding stones and the, the difficulty level steps up quite a lot because when you've got stones all laid out they have to be really specific in their positions they have to land in the right positions at the right height uh, it's all the metals carved up around the stones there's a, a lot more to it when you're adding stones so I want to do one with no stones so it's as simple as possible and then I believe by completing this video it'll make the next stage of difficulty much easier to accomplish because you'll just understand what's going on more so I've been uh, chopping up and milling out a bit of metal from my previous video, check that out. Uh, so making a cluster ring, I have got these bits. I would always be making the plate for my stones first of all. So this bit is gonna be for my stones. And what I've done is milled out to what I think is correct. 1.16 and this one, yeah, just over a mil. So one's a little bit thinner than the other. The thick one's the top where the stones are get set in, thinner one's gonna be underneath. So anyway, I'll just concentrate on that top one for now. Um, not, not working with any stones, so I just kind of working with my metal. Again, like I've said in previous videos, uh, I make things a little bit on the big side. Uh, when I'm showing how to make collets and stuff, I use the big stone because it's easier for me to show what's going on and easier for you to see on video uh, when things are massive. So. 14, 14 mil top this is going to have so I'm going to set my dividers to 7.5 draw a circle with a diameter of 14 mil right so you've got your plate circle scribed on it let's cut this out now going through the job in my mind I'm realizing well I've been in Japan nearly four years and I didn't make cluster rings that often at all when I was in London could be six, seven, eight years since I last made one of these, so this video is like training for me as well. So try and cut it out nicely, but don't worry too much about being super accurate and super perfectly circular, because I'll show you a trick on getting a nice round afterwards. There you go. It's as neat as mine is. If this was gonna have stones in, I still like to cut out a circle first uh, and then I will dome it and then mark it out for the stones to sit in. But as this is like the finished top, um, might as well make an effort to get it really nice and round now. So I'm, what I said earlier about a little trick to get things perfectly round, uh, just cut them kind of nicely, file them up a little bit. I filed the last little notch I got on mine. And then just try and um, find one of these where you can tap it down on can't which is usually the case what I do is I get the bottom of like one of my punches the flat back just tap it down into the the only thing to look out for is to make sure your that's perfectly horizontal and your punch is perfectly vertical 
and you don't have to hit things that hard. You're only taking the edge off. See that? Just minutes from finishing sawing it out. That's a really perfect disc. So next we're going to be doming it, so I want to make sure it's annealed. Actually before we dome it, while it's flat, it's easy to put some marks on there. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking ahead just to get a bit of training for the one with stones in. Uh, we can put a bit of detail on the sides, but we're not working so accurately as going around a stone exactly as it has to. Um, but we can go through the motions of putting a cut in a, in a correct position and do a bit of filing either side of it and get a bit of shape going. <clears throat> it's much easier to put some lines directly opposite each other uh, while this is flat. So I'm going to show you a few ways you can do that. So if you punched it in the center and then used your dividers from that, like I did, you would have a little dot in the center. That's very helpful. What I've done in the past when I've done like six, sevens and fives, um, when it's a bit more difficult to mark around a circle, uh, I just Googled a circle divided by however many sides, however many pieces. So what I do is I do that, print that out, and then I draw circles from the center. It just helps when you're lining up bits on top of it. And then um, just with a marker pen or something or just scratch a little line, just put that on your lines. That's one way of doing it. Another way, I've got this stencil. This one is specific for jewelers, but anything will do from any, any cheap thing from a pound shop. This is from a, like a Hyakuen shop. Uh, same kind of thing, it's just a bit of stationery really. It's got different shapes. Um, all these circles, all different sizes. So you can, as long as they're marked top, bottom, left, right, just put that in one where it fits. Is it going there? Mm, not quite. Anyway, you just want to find one where it lines up nicely. If it's a little bit big, you can, as long as your piece is quite circular, you can put it and get a very good estimation of where the middle is. And then again, just mark the points. That's the, another way you can do it. Another way you can do it. You've got that dot in the center, like I was just mentioned in. Very, very helpful. Just draw a line straight across the middle. And then you've got a line dividing it in two really nicely. And then it'll be very easy just to do another one vertical to that horizontal one. You should be able to line that up quite easily. And uh, yeah, that's another way of doing it. Another way of doing it is using your saw frame. Your saw blade, when it's in there nice and tight, that's a perfectly straight line. That's really useful. Use it all the time for lining things up. So put that across your center. That's top and bottom. Again, very easy to turn it and get the, get the other two marks going directly in the middle. So that's another way of doing it. But the way I'm doing it today is I've recently bought and featured on this channel recently these uh, Millin collets. So I've got these, they're all divided by, I've got some, this one's four, I've got eights and sixes and 12 as well. Uh, yeah, look, that's, that's already marked out. And because of these are new, a new sort of toy, and I wanna, I'm trying to find how they're most useful, I'm using these. So a bit similar to the first two examples I showed about how to mark top, bottom, left, right. I basically got them already marked on this. So I'm just gonna place this on, position it as accurately as I can, and just use a, well, I'll use fine, fine line of marker pen. I'll just put little dots on there. And then that's that, <laughs> they're marked out. So four little black marks on there. One thing I'm gonna do in just to back it up and double check I really like I really like them. I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna use this just to scribe across the center, hitting my marks and make sure I like them. There is a chance one slightly more across than the other. Uh, but again, reminder myself, this is a beginner's piece, so don't worry about this too much, but try and get them good. Everything is practicing, everything is training, so I, I would say always try and do do your best, and that way you're practicing being good before perhaps you've, before you even are, <laughs> if that makes sense. If you just work as though you're very good, you will very quickly become very good. I think that's, that applies to lots of things in life as well. Like you might be really overweight. If you just start living the lifestyle of someone who's in really good shape, you will before long become in really good shape. That's kind of how, how it works. So yeah, these ER collets, done a good job again I do I do like them they are useful worth getting these for how cheap they are on Amazon I think it's worth having a set of these they've been really helpful to me making jewelry right so I just did a load of work thinking our camera was recording but it wasn't uh, I was explaining that this is a little bit back to front compared to 
doing the cluster ring for stones, I'm doing this with beginners in mind. So it's easier to mark top, bottom, left, right on a flat little disc than it is to do it on a domed disc. So that's why I marked it out now. And then next is going in the doming block. So it's a little bit back to front. Um, my marks are very, very light. So I was worried about going through the actions of doming it and then losing my marks I put on there. So I've just went round the marks and just put in my saw blade, just cutting a little nick on the corner. So we're going to cut and file into these anyway. So I just want to make sure I can still see those after doming. So if like me, you put really light marks, I suppose you can just go over them again, put a deeper mark, deeper score in the metal. Um, but I just want to ensure that I can find those marks again after doming. So I recommend you do too. Annealed, marked out nicely. Uh, that's going to be the top. So all your marks, you want to be able to see them on the top of the dome. So put the marks bit in first. Get a ball that fits. I'm going for quite a big size. You haven't got to find one where that just fits in. Just go for one of the bigger ones. Give it a bang. There you go, just a gentle bit of curvature on there. Didn't lose those lines after all that. Anyway, right, so looking from the side, you can see the edge, see that bottom edge, it's like that. That's what was when it was flat, it's domed, so it's this angle now. I'm thinking now let's file that flat. So let's get that vertical. So as our disc is nice and round, we use that to advantage. I'm thinking just to help out uh, keep it nice and round. Use these dividers and go around the outside, just about a mil or something, to draw a line. So you can look at that line as you take that flat up in there. Don't need to, but I think it's just a help for the people who are new to this sort of thing. There's no reason why this can't, again, be put back in this uh, collet block to round it off a bit more. Uh, we'll just we'll be hammering down with the rounded end of the punch now, if you do that again. But anyway, I'm going to divide around it, go in about a mil. It's just going to help me file it nice, get it, get the sides vertical without losing the circularness. Circularity, I don't know what the word is, you know what I mean. Do a kind of good job of making this disc, but don't worry too much about it because we're still working on it. So you can see I've filed that back. I'm now gonna take my, show you one. I'll find a coarse one of these and just whiz around it just to make it nice. But yeah, that's where we are now with this. It's been a long time since I made one of these. Uh, so thinking back how it used to be done, this would normally be like a plate already for the stones. So it's all cut up, all phrased out and everything for the stones to sit in the correct positions. Uh, so with that in mind, there's a little bit more work to do on this one. Uh, you know, like I said, marking out where the four points were. I'm gonna cut into it again cut into it a bit more and then we're going to file out around and then that's about as far as we'll take it. It just gives us a bit more work to do and a bit more experience uh, before going on to the, the next ring where there's going to be a lot more of this going on for, for stones to go in. So we're just sort of going through the motions really. So like I did before, marking the, the four points, I can still see my line so I didn't worry about losing them when I filed, filed out around the edge. So I'm doing that again. I'm going to cut in a bit more this time though. We've got this now, the 1.2 mil plate, domed, four positions marked, the sides filed vertical, and then those four points cut out a little bit, just a, a mil or two, not even two mil, uh, cutting in from the sides. So again, this is just like a little bit of extra design so we can practice what we would be doing if we had stones in. This is how I shape the metal around the outside to fit around stones. So start off with your little saw cut in there, uh, you're going to need a needle file, tri-square, three-sided, little triangular needle file, and a square, four-sided. So I start with the tri-square, it's because it's got that, that angle, it just cuts in a bit nicer. It's sort of a bit more accurate, I don't know, you can sort of push it in exactly where you want it to go with a bit more confidence than the square. But the square will do pretty much the same thing. Hold that, put your finger on the flat, got the corner, we're pushing into the metal now, so... Just keep it vertical, keep it parallel with what we filed around the outside. Try and hold the piece steady. 
I cut straight into it. There was a chance, like, I saw I just do it, did it. Not dead straight, it's a little bit tilted one way or the other. That's quite easy to make that mistake. I just did it, so, but I did a, what I do is I file a little bit and then look at it and see what I'm doing. Okay, I'm tilting my little bit to the right too much. So, just bring it back to the center. I mean, basically, all my videos when I'm making stuff, I'm always saying to stop and look at what you're doing. So you've got to understand what's going on. And that's how you avoid going too far and making a mistake. Basically, just working carefully and attentively. So, I will just open that up as deep as the saw cut is, or was, and then move to my square, and then that just obviously goes from that to opens it up a little bit. Obviously it depends on the shape of the stones and stuff, the curvature of the stones you're working to, but commonly I'll start with a tri-square then go to a square, so that's why I'm thinking of doing it today. Okay, do that on all four. Practice sticking to your line, your mark, uh, making sure you've got four top, bottom, left, right, and they're all got, kind of look like little arrows all pointing to each other. So practicing using the files and uh, and actually the direction of them as well, not tilting them about, and just making sure you've got these little points all directly opposite each other. So a little bit of practice for accuracy and dexterity with your tools. So a next step, a next thing we can do to practice going through the motions, like imagine there's a stone in the centre and then there's stones going around the, the outside. Uh, that would be a little groove that sits in between two stones, two round stones. So that metal needs to be rounded off now as well. So my technique for doing that is you keep the uh, file moving and then rock it as well. It's got a lot of weight in it. If you wanted to, you could put a flat that way first and then round it off. See that? See what I'm doing? I'm rocking it. As long as you keep it rocking, it does round off, sort of naturally, quite easily. It's not like you've got to really concentrate on the type of curvature you're putting on there. Is that showing up on camera? That's rounding off now. Might, might feel a little bit awkward first time you try it, but it's all, I, I feel like it's just in my fingertips really. I'm not tilting my wrist too much, maybe perhaps a little bit, but my fingers are doing a lot of work, just rocking it backwards and forwards in my fingers. So it's a technique you've got to practice when you're rounding off metal for like tight curves around small stones. I'll just show you up close what I've done. There you go, just a little nick with rounded off little uh, Vs cut out of it, nothing nothing too crazy, nothing special. Just wanted to mention, if you look at the back, it highlights your accuracy in your work uh, a little bit more. It's another way of checking what you've done. So just get them all matching best you can. If you cut in more one than the other three, then get the other three matching that deeper one. Like I say, it's not that important, just going through the motions to practice a few techniques. So anyway, that is, if that was for stones, that would all be cut up, holes in it, all nice and rounded off around the outside stones and stuff. So this is our uh, beginner's version of a cluster head. Okay, so we're doing the, the bottom now that's gonna join underneath what we just made. And um, I was mentioning at the start of the video, I can't, it's been ages since I made one of these, sort of can't really remember how to do it. <laughs> it's, uh, what it is, I can go through the job to completion in my mind, but there's the intricacies of the knowledge to end up with the best the best version of what you're making, things like that. I mean, what I mean by that is uh, like that plate, it looks a bit thick to me. Maybe I think I started 1.2 or just under 1.2. It's a little bit heavy looking once you file that side up. Um, this is a bit thinner, just under a mil, I think. Yeah, just over a mil, 1.02. So perhaps that's what the top should have been. This could, you could get away with the same or even a little bit thinner again, but um, I'm, I'm going to continue with it and see see how I feel because the way I'm thinking of after that's domed and joined on there, it's not going to make the side look thicker. Uh, you'll find out what I'm on about when we get to that. So anyway, it's kind of similar story. What I'm thinking of doing is just putting what we made on top of that plate and scoring around it. So next step. Okay, so we're going to score around this now, or scribe around it, I should say. 
So your new plate with the lines marked on there. I'm gonna recommend cutting that out. Just go around it like a circle. Don't worry about going in and out of these grooves. Just file them in like you did last time. I got a bit carried away. I was meant to film the last little bit coming out. So I'll just pretend to do that. Zugga, 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 goom. There you go. So I've cut this out and uh, you can see I'm just around that outside of the line and uh, gives me space to file it a bit neater. Um, do that trick again to get the edge nice and round and then we'll dome it and then it won't, definitely won't be too small to use on this. So that's why I like playing it safe by making things a little bit bigger on purpose just so I can fine tune it to exactly what I need. Okay, for the sake of the length of this video, um, don't want to repeat loads of information, so I'm doing the same again. I'm tapping it in there, getting it nice and round, tidying it up with a file and that paper whizzer, and then I'm just going to dome it. You can use the same doming block or perhaps even a bit tighter. Depends what we can get away with. Maybe just go for the same one, play it safe. Um, but yeah, certainly you could. If you make one for yourself, um, you can experiment with different curvatures for the top and bottom. But just for simplicity, let's do it all the same. Yeah, as I suspected, it is slightly, slightly bigger. So I'm going to file around the outside and then I'm going to adjust it to fit snug underneath that one. So I'll show you that when I'm doing it. But I just want to say sorry if it, if it appears that I'm figuring, figuring this out as I go along. But what it is, the difference between now and the last time I made one, which literally years ago, uh, I would have just made it. I would have just got on with it. And then like, say, like got to this stage, it's exactly the same. It's like, okay, it's a bit big, just adjust it, go down. Now I'm making one on video. I've got to try and really understand what I'm doing and what just happened when I just did something so I can convey that information to people who are looking to learn and just make everything understandable. I can't just do it and assume that it's all clear and straightforward. So Same as before, except I don't really want that outer edge, uh, like vertical. Um, I'm happy with this because looking at it, the size of it is just the same size, perhaps just a tiny amount smaller, which is great. Certainly don't want it any bigger. So looking at it from the top, you don't want a sort of bit of metal around the outside. So what I'm gonna do now is, you see the, this top one's domed, yeah? So that underneath surface is going up at that angle. I want to match that angle around the outside of this. So from that from that side, it's going to look the same. Just on that side, we're just taking that in because we are next going to solder it together. So you want it clicking clicking in there underneath nicely. So that's what I meant by putting that angle on again. Um, just went around it straight to get the size right, the dimensions good, and now we're sort of repeating that angle a little bit to. Uh, to get it to fit snug underneath that so it can be soldered in well. Just to so you're aware, the angle I filed it that seemed to be correct is about that. So that's horizontal, that's like that. And uh, did most of it holding it this way, zigga, 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 up and down by rotating it. And then just to finish it off and get it all sort of smooth and at the same angle all the way around, uh, then just hold it that way and just did that. So that's how I achieved this and show you how it fits. See that I've gone quite sharp on the edge and it all that flat sits up inside that top bit. Can't see it around the outside from the top, but it is pretty much the same size. That now is ready for soldering in. And then when it's soldered in, we will uh, cut into it and replicate, bring that down. Right, it's coming back to me a little bit now, looking at this. If this was for stones, that would have like kind of big hole in the center and surrounded by smaller round holes. Uh, that would have to have some sort of design and holes cut in it as well. So I'd have this, I would get to this stage, get it fit in, just a domed piece that fits inside, and then tack it, just two small solders opposite to hold it in position. Uh, then the little scoops around the outside, replicate those going down so you're making a, a proper piece that fits to the back of that. Um, when you've got more of those scoops, you get them all lined up really well, really perfectly, and then throw it on the floor. I don't know where that's gone. I'll get it in a minute. But anyway, yeah, then you can um, untack it 
unsolder it and then you're free to have it on your bench and you can cut it out really neatly and get the design on there whatever's whatever makes sense to what you've done on the top so yeah that's a lot of work we're not doing today <laughs> so you might as well just solder it on there's no stones so there's no holes to cut out the bottom bit um but we are going to replicate those ones so just solder it on properly and then we'll cut down in line with these grooves and cut into the into the bottom basket Okay, ready for soldering. What I'm doing, I've got it clamped in my tweezers with a, like a little toggle thing, just sliding on there. That squeezes it shut quite nicely, so it's nice and secure in there. I ain't got to worry about it falling out of position. Yeah, just be careful, line it up, get it all lined up really nicely. So you're soldering it in the correct position. You don't want one going one side or the other. Okay, loads of flux all the way around it. I'm just gonna touch quite a big bit of solder on, so I'm hoping it floods quite a long way around. Ideally that goes around your seam where you want it joined and not all over around the outside. Because if you work a bit messily like that, you end up having to clean loads of, loads of solder off the surface at the next stage. And um, just a messy way to work. So if you can just do everything accurately, you'll work quicker and then you'll end up with a nice crisply, accurately, nicely made finished piece rather than one that you've had to sort of keep work on, repairing and tidying up as you went along. <clears throat> Trying to get the heat underneath that a little bit. I should I should move it towards the edge of the charcoal block really. See if I can get away with it. There you go. It's time to go now. There you go. I can see the solder went both sides of that V and then I saw it come along here a little bit. But I will add a bit more solder and this one and hopefully get solder going across there and then join that up properly. Okay, so you should have something like that all soldered up all the way around. It's a bit different when you've got more, more stones, there's more of those scoops. So there's only sort of like little spots where you have to put solder. So it's actually soldering these two together is probably the only stage where it's more difficult now than it is when you've got the more complica complicated design with all the stones in. There's just more solder to put in basically and flood it around a bit further. So anyway, you've got this, you've got your top and bottom. Next, I'm gonna, again, like I did with the top one, put a little nick in and then start filing it out to match the top. And I think probably benefit from putting some sort of come down towards the center a little bit, just to give it a bit of design, just to practice things a little bit more. So we're doing that next. We're about to, using the shapes we cut out the top part, we're gonna use those to sort of do something similar down the back. Um, I think it might be a benefit to know where exactly the middle is. So it might have been an idea to score that while it was flat, but never mind. Um, it's, not, it's not too difficult to do it now. So I'm just gonna use my dividers to find halfway, just uh, what I do is I guess halfway, normally get very close, and then just go to the opposite side. Anyway, just whatever you've got to do, just find the middle. I've said loads of times on my channel before on my videos, a lot of jewelers you'll see will use a center punch or a spike or something and they'll just tap into it. That's great on flat sheets, I do that, but when I've got something that's assembled, especially something like this, that's, that's a hollowed out piece. So if I just bang into that, quite likely to damage it, it's gonna cave in. So uh, find your center point and then with a, a small ball burr, just carefully phrase it a little bit, and then that's your center. Uh, I wanted to do that because it's useful when we're cutting down from these grooves on the side. It's nice to have a, a center point to aim for so they all look nice against each other. Again, like very similar to what we already did on the top part, cutting into it perfectly in line with what's already on the top. Gonna cut down and then put my saw blade from my cut over my center point. Just cut a little line a short distance down. So I've done that. So only a few mil, three, four mil. And then uh, we're gonna be filing it up and making it look, uh, making it flow into the top. When other jewelers are checking out your work, they will know to look at the back of the piece you made and that will tell the story about how it was made and probably give a lot more insight into your skill level. So we're working on what's gonna be underneath the ring. So it's still really important to do a good job because that's what makes the difference between 
a nice looking piece and one that's actually high quality you can sort of when a stone's set everywhere you can sort of fake things looking really good if the polish is good and the stones are nice uh doesn't mean it's made really nicely though so um yeah make sure when you're doing these cuts they all go opposite each other nice and in line not one going this way this day uh you need to work carefully it's a simple idea you may understand perfectly well what needs to be done doesn't mean you can just charge ahead and do it quickly you have to work carefully even doing the most simple things it's my advice for this so like what i just did with that saw cut doing that all four positions and just be careful they all line up nicely go towards the center just like before the tri-square three-sided needle file and your square go in again being careful not to disturb your nice curves you carefully put in the top uh, that should all be nice and round and nice and accurate and that's now a, uh, a good guide for you to work nicely on the back as well there's almost less thinking to do because you previous step you worked accurately and carefully and that makes this step easier to achieve a good result so i'm just cutting in and then see i'm like rocking rocking into it like that And we'll probably go round it, round off this edge. And then I'm thinking I might just drill through it. I might just put a drill hole in the back because that might help when we're um, uh, putting the shank on just to line things up nicely. Did all four with the tri-square, now we're going on to the square square. I so hope you can see what I've done there. That flat around the outside is too, too heavy. I think my top plate was too thick really to begin with. Uh, so anyway, I'm hiding the fact that's really thick now by just rounding that off. So I literally, with my big file, not even using my needle file. Held like that. Got it kind of good and then held it sideways and just rounded it off nicely. Just looking at that side just to try and keep that even all the way around. So yeah, a bit of that really. Not hugely complicated or difficult to do. And just rounds it off nicely. Just reduces the clunkiness of it and just blends the bot the back into the front or the top I should say. So just with the square file I just tidied up the corners a little bit, respecting the flat I want to remain on the side, and then sort of connected the top to the bottom like that. Just did that all the way around. Um, so yeah, next I'm gonna I'm gonna put a big drill hole in that and then just paper it up, make it look nice, get it to the next stage of goodness. And uh, then we're making a shank. I put the hole in, look, I just wanted to say, uh, putting that hole in is a good idea for soldering the shank on because it helps the heat escape that. So 1.7, two mil, it's gonna be a ring that way. So it's two mil looking at it from the side and then I'm gonna stretch it up so it joins on the side there and goes up the side of uh, underneath the back plate. And I want to make the ring with a solid style shank because uh, keeping it in mind, beginners are going to be trying this. So just trying to really keep this as simple as possible. So no fancy V shape uh, split shanks or, you know, split shoulders and stuff. None of that going on. Uh, can do that next time if you want. Uh, but for this one, just keep it basic. So it's going to be a solid shank. Turn up your metal, choose your finger size and uh, another opportunity to practice making a ring a specific size because that's what it's like being a professional jeweler you don't just make it for whatever you feel like it's got to be it's got to be exactly correct for someone um but if you are like what i'm doing today just sort of going through the motions and practicing it perhaps choose a slightly smaller ring size because the rings rings always seem to look better with a smaller finger size don't, know, don't ask me why they're just aesthetically more pleasing to me anyway uh anyway so i'm gonna get this the size i want get it nice and round and then basically uh, should I solder it up? Yeah, solder it up. So let's make a ring. Make a ring your size. I've got 2 mil, just to clarify something again. 1.7 by 2 mil. The 2 mil is on the side. I want it, I want it as high as possible. 
So I've got mine in my tweezers in front of me. Um, don't worry too much about the solder join. It's got to be strong, but it hasn't really got to look pretty. So we're about to do a lot of hammering and filing on the, on the ring right over the join. What I was on about earlier is tapping it up, called a tap up shank. I put it on my metal block and I hit it, hit it just between those two black lines I've put on the, on the ring. But the hammer's slightly at that angle and I put it close to the edge so I'm not damaging my hammer or damaging the metal block. Uh, sort of tapping it like that. And the idea is I want, in, just in between those two black lines, I just want it stretched up a little bit. And I would like for the width of the ring looking from the inside to stay the same, but just, just the outside to stretch up and go thinner. So from, from there, do you know what I mean? It's, that inner edge is the same, but as it goes up, it sharpens up. So not going razor sharp, but just stretching up a little bit. And then that's going to be our shank. And then that will, will then shape it, we'll file it up to fit to the head. This metal block, it's got one corner rounded off. Uh, it's just how it come from new, but it's been really useful. So I recommend having that just by, if you've just got a normal metal block, like just all straight sides, I recommend grinding that off however you can. If you've got a grinding motor, great. Or if you've just got a grinding wheel, you can put on your polishing motor, uh, just grind off that sharp corner and then tidy it up with your buff sticks. It uh, hasn't got to be polished or anything, but just nice and evenly rounded. Doing this kind of job is really helpful because I can now do that on the edge. I haven't got to worry about my hammer banging into a sharp corner, that w which will either damage the corner or damage my hammer. So it just protects you from a little bit of collateral damage doing jobs. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's going to start hammering. Hammer, a little bit of that angle, and I'm sort of hitting and letting it run off that side. That's my join, by the way, right in the middle of those dots. So I'm hammering over my join. Just stretching it up, trying to stretch it more in the center and then gradually less and less as it goes down the sides. And then regularly turn it over and do it on the other side as well. It gets tidied up with your file afterwards, so don't worry about doing it too perfectly, but as always, you do a good job and then it makes the next step easier, so there'll be less filing to do and um, less corrections if you hammer it nicely. Okay, so I'll show you my work. So from the side, you can see just that section there is raised up. Uh, you, you can just raise up more the center. I actually got mine raised up and then widened the raised, raised bit a little bit because putting it next to my head, that's going to be uh, a benefit for filing it into shape. So you see as it goes down, it sort of removing quite a lot of metal so I wanted that raised section quite wide so I'm still benefit benefiting from it even quite far down the shank so yeah that's what I've done so basically just a bit of hammering and looking from the side you want to keep it kind of central you don't want one side flat and then the other side doing all the slanting you want it to sort of go into a point and uh, that point should be sort of in the middle don't worry about it too much because you're doing all the tidying up with a file but as always try to do things a bit neatly and accurately and then the next step is much quicker and easier. So I just put my attention on the actual back of the shank quickly and realise it looks really exaggeratedly heavy. So I'm setting my dividers to 1.4 which is still quite chunky and uh, from the inner edge just going to score a line around it and then we'll, we can file, file the back of the shank first and then that helps you shape up the shoulders nicely working from the shank. So it's probably good advice to do this, do this first. I suppose you should put your ring back on your ring stick as well and tap it around, get it nice and round first. Yeah, definitely do that, let's do that first. <laughs> get it round, <laughs> dividers, 1.4, whatever you choose, and then we'll just go around the back, file it up nice. Like say my solder joins about there. Say my solder joins about there. Directly opposite, you can do quarters as well. Uh, all of this, probably from about there. All of this is being removed up to my scribed line. And then from there, we will, I'm cutting out a section. That might be cut out, so. <laughs> Don't feel like I'm explaining anything very well today. So like that. It's going to be filed off 
So a bit more from that corner. That's probably going to be cut out. Oh, this stupid pen. Did any of what I just said and did make any sense? It helps if we've got a pen that works. Okay, I'm just going to stop talking. <laughs> okay, forget about all that. Just 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, if that's a clock face. 10 o'clock position, 2 o'clock position. Just file it down to that scribed line. Just do that first. <laughs> Okay, so see that's just thinned off a bit. It's still a bit chunky, but it's sort of evenly thinned off around the back. So now I'm gonna prepare it for fitting snug up against the bottom of this. Um, I want it to go uh, in between our grooves, so it's not like gonna sit in line with those, it's gonna sit like that. But anyway, uh, how I'll start to figure that out is I'm just gonna do most of it by file. First of all, just so I get an idea of what I may need to do, is I'll just put that and line it up. So I get an idea of the curvature and the distance that needs to be filed out. I'll just study it for a bit. Might even try and hold it in position and put a few dots on there just to help me out. But basically, I, I imagine, well, first of all, look, my solder joint is there. I imagine it's gonna be a sort of quite a gentle curve. And I'm gonna, while it's together, I'm gonna do all the filing just so it holds its position nice and strong. And then I am, when it's nearly uh, fit in there really nicely, I'm just gonna cut out a section. Before I get going on this, just wanna show you my drawing there. That's still not perfect, but when I've drawn that, put that over, I think the ends are gonna come out. It's a little bit too scooped, but it's a good starting point. I think I'm gonna file that out first. I'm expecting to have to flatten out the ends a little bit, and, uh, and then it should be fitting all right. But basically, uh, just from putting them together, looking over it and drawing it and trying to figure out what's gonna happen. I know how to proceed, so I'm gonna proceed. Ring file will do most of the work. I even put flat on that first. Do you know what? I'm gonna start with my saw blade. I'm gonna cut that out. I think that's gonna fast forward the, the job a little bit. So yeah, I'm gonna cut that out. a lot lot faster than doing all the work with a file just gives me a head start so I'm looking at a gap you can see it's hitting hitting the ends not going down right to the bottom so I need to widen it basically widen it I'll get it probably a nice shape and then just try and lower it so I do actually eventually want to break through there so I'll go right down to it so it's really thin and I may just cut out a little section to expose that hole on the back reduced that scoop and worked on a little bit so it's fitting nicer but while before I go down it's still got a little bit of strength in it it's probably a good idea to shape up the shoulders nicely now as well so I'm just going to work a bit more carefully around the back of the shank and then get these shoulders looking nice and symmetrical like matching each other uh, I may sharpen it up a little bit as well so working on the side as well so basically I'm going over it just tidying it up before I commit to cutting it open Okay, so I think I'm ready to cut mine through now. So I'll just to show you what it looks like. I've just papered it around. That'll go on there tight enough for a good solder. And uh, I'm not, like I said, I think I said before, I'm not going to cut it open. Just put one cut in there and then open it up because that changes all the curvatures and the distances. I'm actually going to cut a distance out big enough to expose that hole fully. And they'll go on there like that. So the old marker pen again, just put a little black line on the side just so I can put it up to that and then see if that's the correct amount to cut out, which I think it is. It's a little bit short, but good. I like that. I can just put a bud phrase in the, in the hole or something and tidy it up. Okay, so I've got both parts clamped together in my big tweezers here. Uh, you've got to be really careful when you're setting things up for soldering. So I'm, uh, I mean, getting things in position nicely. So I look at it from the side, the head, perfectly like that. Shank has to be perfectly up, directly in the center. Looking at it on the top, making sure the shank's going across and it's sitting in between my cutouts, either side of the head, both sides symmetrically, all looks nice and even. Uh, looking at it from the side, shank is not rotated around a little bit. It's going directly, it's sitting directly in the middle and it's not, it's perfectly straight to the head and it's not one side or the other as well. It's got to look in the middle. I really hate that when you make a ring and it sort of looks like the head's here and the ring shank's slightly to the side. Can happen easily. 
Uh, so look out for that. Also, all the joins are tight and it's got to solder nicely. So basically, it's got to look good from all directions. So I've got it in conveni conveniently in front of me. I've uh, carefully positioned it. I think it's good for soldering now. I do miss being around other jewelers. Sometimes I'd set something up and then just show the person next to me if they thought it was straight. Especially if you spend a long time trying to line something up, you sort of realise you can't even decide if it's right or not. It's not like it's obvious if it is right. Sometimes you really can't tell. So it's nice to be able to ask someone next to you. This is silver. I'm hoping it's strong enough not to collapse on me when I'm soldering it. There is a bit of tension on that. I am nervous with silver. Maybe I should go for easy solder. I think that might have just tacked on. So can you see what's happened to that ring? That hasn't soldered enough. And I was looking at it closely. It's actually that bit joining the head is lifted up because the, the just the light bit of pressure clamping that together, the ring's gone out of shape. So it's squashed it down and that's gone like that. So yeah, I've kind of ruined it. <laughs> it's what I hate about silver. Really difficult to finish off nicely. In platinum or gold, that wouldn't happen. It's because the whole thing gets hot, it conducts heat so much, and it just kind of anneals at a really low temperature. And it doesn't take much for that heat. Even though I'm putting all the heat there, it's conducting right around there and it's just going soft. So yeah, it's a little bit out of shape. That's a bit of a shame. So um, I'm gonna try and get that. But I've, it's actually quite a big problem. I've got to try and get that really nicely round again perfectly in line and then line it all up and basically start again from having the two bits separate so i'm gonna get on with doing that and then find an alternative way to hold it in position next time okay so back to the old usual set chris off complaining again it happens all the time when i finish in these videos i get to this last stage i try and hold it the normal way where it's really convenient and i can look around it and get the position just how i want it that fails, <laughs> balls it up a little bit, then i have to take a step back and do loads of trial and error experiments trying to set it up nicely so that's because it's got a bit rounded. It doesn't sit securely on the flat surface. I've got my magic paste stuff. That's on there. Then I can push it and get it to sit the, exactly the angle that the tweezers will hold that ring at. And then I've got a little um, got a ball burr underneath the back of the spring tweezers to hold that secure as well. So that's not, that can't rock about. That can't rock about. Everything's all lined up nicely. So let's try again. No pressure on it now. So it's just held in one position by the tweezers. So there's no reason for it to go out of shape. there's hardly any weight on it now so even the flux boiling could potentially move it so i'm warming it up slowly slowly okay so i've got a, not fully soldered but i've got that tacked on really strong so i'm gonna let it cool down a bit and have a close look at it and make sure i like how everything's all lined up and stuff and uh, hopefully it's good and i'll can easily solder the other side now okay give you an update um I didn't film too much because adding tiny little bits of solder and then doing the solder is quite time consuming so I didn't film too much. But basically I got, after I thought it was ballsed up, it wasn't that bad actually, I uh, just, they were a little bit out of a line so I just shaped it carefully and then got it sitting back in the position I wanted to and uh, just fronted a bit more solder on it, it worked quite well. So now I'm adding a little bit more to the second side, or the first side, sorry. So that's the one I did second, that's soldered on really well now. So I'm adding a bit more solder to the first side and hopefully this is uh, this completes it. So I thought I should at least show you the last solder. I'm gonna have to rotate this. Sorry if that's not on camera. Here we go, it's going, it's going. Yeah, okay out the acid i'll show you up close i think i mentioned before the danger of you add a little bit of solder and it goes the wrong way and then you you can either pull it back into position or if you've got to add a little bit more like what's happening on the left there it all floods together and you end up with too much a bit over over soldered but anyway it's it's together the ring is complete, still got a bit of an egg shape look where it's squashed that shape. So I can, now that's soldered on there really strong, I can reshape it, I'll file it up. 
rubber wheels down my solder joins and uh, yeah, done. There's our no stone cluster ring. I'm not going to bother getting it polished or anything, but I'm going to try and finish it nicely. It is a sort of training piece ring, so I should get all the solder cleaned off, all the uh, surfaces sort of nice. A solder build up here. So I've given myself extra work now to tidy that up. So being careful to only reduce the solder build up and not start taking the metal away underneath it. And that's a nod of appreciation for all the jewelers throughout history do it with my buff stick no fancy modern or even electrical technology look at the sides as well and one last little thing I want to do to it is just tidy up that hole so I've got a like a flame burr I call that flame phrase uh, leave it a little bit long coming out of your chuck Look straight down and then I go to the other side of my shank as well because I can't go absolutely directly vertically down on it et voila the basics the foundations, the building blocks of a cluster ring. This is a, a basic level cluster ring as well. There are far more difficult versions, difficult ways to make a cluster ring. This version is quite an easy, simple one. So you've done the top, uh, put that shape in it. So you practice cutting in accurately in, in uh, positions that had to be all accurate with each other and then shaped them out, which is what you'll be doing, working around stones that go around the outside of a center one. And then doing the back plate that was all shaped to fit the top plate perfectly. And then we continued the that design down there. So you're practicing doing the fancy back plates. Uh, the shank joined the on in position. And basically, there you go. There's your stoneless cluster ring. And if you've completed that, you've practiced a lot of things that are gonna be very useful to doing a more difficult version. So we'll do a very similar one next time, but with stones in, and there's a lot more work, a lot more difficulty making it precisely for the stones. So do that next. But yeah, have a go.